morning, everybody. Good to see you today. Welcome to the Topics class. We're starting a new series today called Paul and the Seven Churches. And um, this is kind of qu quite a bit different series from what we have done. Today is going to be a lot of uh, historical stuff, but it all relates to the Word of God. And then we're going to get into some of the more meatier part a little bit later on. Okay, let's look to God in prayer and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, now once again we come before you and we rejoice because our names are written in heaven. You told us to rejoice because our names are written in heaven. Recorded there in the book of life. And Lord, we're so grateful that we have heard the gospel and received Christ. And Lord, now we pray that you bless this fellowship together in this time together. And bless in the study of your word, we pray. Glorify your name in our midst and edify your people, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Paul and the seven churches. In the book of Revelation, the first three chapters of Revelation, we have seven churches that are mentioned there, all of which are, the Bible says, in Asia. And when the Bible talks about Asia, it literally means Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. Turkey didn't become a nation until fairly recently, I think a little over 100 years or something like that. Um, but it, it, the, uh, the seven churches in the book of Revelation are all located in modern-day modern day Turkey. In Revelation 1-4, it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then in the 11th verse, it lists them. Uh, there is uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. There's also seven other churches in the Bible. And these other seven churches are addressed by Paul. And uh, we, here's a list of them here. There's Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1st and 2nd uh, Thessalonians. Uh, the New Testament has 21 epistles in it, and um, only uh, they, they are addressed to only seven local churches. That, that's kind of a, a mind-boggling thought when, uh, when you first realize that. But there's only seven churches that uh, has an epistle addressed to them in the entire New Testament. Some epistles are addressed to an individual, some are just general epistles and, and so forth. Now, let's look at that list once again. First of all, it is Romans, um, the book of Romans. Uh, turn there, please, if you will, to the last chapter, Romans chapter 16. And we find that in the city of Rome, there were a number of churches. It, just, it wasn't just one church. There, were, there was, uh, was numerous churches there in Rome. Uh, if you look at the very first verse of chapter 16, Paul says, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centuria. Well, that's a local church. And then if you look at the end of verse 4, Right down at the end of verse 4, it says, all the churches of the Gentiles. So there was, we don't know how many more, but there was others. And then in verse 5, where he's talking about Priscilla and Aquila, he says, likewise greet the church that is in their house. There's another local church that is spoken of there. You go over to verse 14, right at the end of verse 14, and uh, has a number of names there. And, it, and then it concludes by saying, and the brethren which are with them. That would be another local church located there in the city of Rome. And then in verse 15, right at the end of the verse, it says, and all, the, after giving some other uh, names, all the saints which are with them. So here's another local church located in Rome, probably in, in different houses. And then verse 16 concludes by saying, the churches, plural, of Christ salute you. So in the city of Rome, there was not just one church. There were a number of churches. In the epistle to the Galatians, uh, Galatians is addressed to the churches, plural, of, of Galatia. Um, then look down at Colossians. Uh, if you turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4, we have an interesting scripture that has caused a lot of 
uh, conversation and um, wonderment amongst God's people in Colossians 4 and verse 16. And when this epistle, meaning the epistle to the Colossians, is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. Well, we know about Laodicea. That's one of the churches in the book of Revelation. And then it goes on and says, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Somebody said, did some of the church epistles get lost? Was there an epistle to Laodicea that we don't have? Uh, if you watch the History Channel and some of those programs, they'll probably tell you, yeah, there's a whole bunch of books of the Bible that got lost and all that business. That's not true. God has preserved his word. His word, everything that God wants in his word is there today. Uh, it, it, he has preserved it, the Bible says, in Psalm 12, unto all generations. But the book of Ephesians was originally addressed to not any one particular church. It simply said to the uh, Paul, the apostle, of, uh, to the, and then it was left blank. And it was, a church, it was a, a, an epistle that went to Ephesus and very possibly to the seven churches of the book of Revelation. And when it refers here to the epistle from the Laodiceans, it's probably talking about the book of Ephesians. So all of these are local churches and but there were only seven of them that actually had an epistle addressed to them and so um, moving along then in the book of revelation the seven churches are all in asia minor which is modern day turkey but the seven churches that paul has written to they are both in europe and in asia minor so paul wrote to seven churches a total of nine epistles because there's second Corinthians and second Thessalonians and interesting enough all second epistles have apostasy as a theme that's an interesting uh, note on the construction of the New Testament Paul writes first Corinthians deals with all the problems in the church he comes to second Corinthians the apostasy of the church he uh, writes first Thessalonians it's all about the rapture of the church and so forth. He comes to 2 Thessalonians. It's all about the rapture in the church, the apostasy in the church. 2 Timothy is about the apostasy in the church. All second epistles, 2 Peter, 2 John, so forth. They're all about the apostasy. That's the first and second laws of thermodynamics. The trend of everything is downward and away from God. Man is moving, doing his best to move as fast as he can away from God. And this apostasy, which is prophesied in the Bible, settled into the church way back there in the first century before the, first, before the New Testament was ever, was ever uh, completed. So Paul's seven churches, they cover two continents, four churches in Europe and three churches in three churches in Asia. The churches in Europe there are Rome, Corinth, Philippi, and Thessalonica. And going to the next page, the churches in Asia are Galatia, Ephesians, and Colossae. The other epistles Paul wrote were addressed to individual people. First and second Timothy, Titus, Philemon. And Paul didn't write the epistles of John, of course, but second John and third John is also addressed to individual people. Then there are a number of epistles that are addressed to dispersed Jewish Christians. Not any one particular church, but just Jews that were fleeing for their life. They had been dispersed because of the persecution. And that would be Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and 1st John, and Jude. These are all Jewish churches. Now, the Old Testament was written to Jews under the Mosaic Law. That is just absolutely evident. You can't hardly read the Old Testament without understanding that. The Gospels, however, were written basically about the kingdom because the kingdom was at hand. That's why the word kingdom is in the Gospel of Matthew 55 times. The word grace isn't even in there. All right. Well, the epistles are written to the church exclusively. Local churches, God works through local churches. 
God has ordained local churches, individual church. This is a local church. God never set up a, uh, a uh, organizational thing because the church is not an organization. It's an organism. It's a living thing. It's the body of Christ. And each local church is ordained of God. It, it has a function in that area or that community uh, uh, where, where it is located. And if you want to understand church doctrine, if you want to understand church truth, if you want to understand Christian living, if you want to understand all of these things pertinent to the Christian life, you read the church epistles. That was, is what was written pertinent to us today. Now the Bible tells us that all scripture is written for us. In Romans chapter 15 of verse 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So all, all the scriptures were written for us and we can profit from studying the entire Bible. But all scriptures were not written to us. And that's the difference. Jesus said in Revelation 3.22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Who would that be? The local churches. God has blessed and ordained local churches. So the epistles, therefore, are written to us. This, this is where church truth is found. Now in 2 Peter 1.12, Peter writes, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. That's church truth. That's the present truth. That's the present dispensation in which we are living. That's, that, that's church truth there. Well, Paul's epistles are for all the churches. All the churches in Romans 16, 4, it says, Who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. That's who Paul wrote to. All the churches of the Gentiles. That was his ministry, because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. And in 1 Corinthians, he says, And so ordain I in all the churches. Continuing on in 1 Corinthians 14, 33 and 34, he says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. And then he goes on and says, let your women keep silent in the churches, plural. He's not talking just to the church at Karn. He says, in all of the churches. And then 1 Corinthians 16, 1, concerning the collection for the saints, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia, even so, do ye. So Paul, Paul is writing unto the churches. And then finally in 2 Corinthians 11, besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Jesus expressed care for, for Israel and, and the city of Jerusalem. He said in Matthew 23, 7, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I gather thee as a hen gathers as chickens, but ye would not come. He cared for his people, the Jews. Paul equally cares for, cared for the churches. He had established these churches. You know what Paul did is, was an, uh, absolutely an amazing thing. One of the things he said is, I have not built upon another man's foundation. How did he do that? He went into Gentile lands, went in cold. They'd never heard the gospel, never heard of Jesus. And he preached the gospel, got people saved, and established churches there. His ministry was absolutely amazing, and he jealously guarded that ministry. Okay, going to the, to the next page, we're going to see where the apostasy begins to set in. And it begins to set in in Asia. Now remember, Paul wrote to seven churches, four were in Europe, three were in Asia. Well, Paul begins his ministry in Asia, obviously because he was from Asia. He was from uh, Tarsus, that's in modern day Turkey. And God gave him a special call to go into Europe. Paul didn't want to go into Europe. 
he wanted to minister there in Asia. But notice in Acts 16, verse 6 through 9. Now, when they had gone through Phrygia, that's in Asia, and the region of Galatia, that's in Asia, and they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Paul went as far as the Lord wa uh, allowed him to go in Asia. And God had a reason for that. Now the passage goes on and says, After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia. That's another city in Asia. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, suffered them not, or would not permit him to do it. And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas. Troas is another city in Asia. But they had to pass it by. And then a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia, that's in Europe, and praying him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And this is where God directs Paul to take the gospel from Asia, not from them because they had the gospel, but to quit preaching there in Asia and go into Europe and bring the gospel in, into Europe. Come over into Macedonia and help us. So the word of God invaded Europe. The history of the world was changed right there. Right at that very moment, the history of the world was changed. Had Paul not gone into Europe, you can only speculate on what would have happened. Did you know that way back there, 2,000 years ago, Asia was basically a cultured, civilized, highly developed society, most of Asia. Europe, outside of Greece and Rome, Europe was nothing but a bunch of barbarians. And Paul had to take that gospel and go into the, those basically uncivilized uh, what are modern day countries, there weren't countries back then, or at least not the same countries that we think of today. He had to go in there with the gospel, a bunch of half civilized individuals. And the history of the world was changed right then and there. Had that not happened, we would not be sitting over here in America sending out missionaries to Asia. We would be sitting here as heathens with missionaries from Asia coming to evangelize us. And the way things have been going lately, that's not a bad idea. But at any rate, the whole history of the world was changed right then and there. God changed Paul's directions. So Europe went from a bunch of barbarians into a cultured, civilized society, which endured for a number of centuries. Now it's pretty much run its course now. Asia, on the other hand, de degenerated into a bunch of half-civilized individuals, uh, savage-type uh, individuals, and so forth, which we'll get into a little bit later. So, Paul went back after he went into Macedonia and into Europe. Paul went back and did minister some more in Asia, but we're going to follow a progression now. First of all, in the year 56 AD, here's Paul's report on Asia. That's in Acts chapter 19 and verse 10. And this continued by the space of two years so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. All they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Does that word all really mean all? You know, we take as much of the Bible literally as we can. When the plain sense of Scripture makes sense, we look for no other sense. But sometimes God uses symbolic or figurative language. When the Bible here speaks of all, it doesn't mean each, every individual necessarily. It means every area, went into every area. All the area of Asia, some way or other, heard the gospel. Now let me show you an interesting parallel in the Word of God. In Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. All the world, 
all creatures. Jesus also said in Matthew 28 to go and teach all nations whatsoever I have taught you. So you have all the world, all creatures, and all nations. That was the commission Jesus gave the 12. If you can accept that word all as meaning the, the area, Paul all by himself fulfilled all three of those areas. Turn in your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 16, the last chapter of the book of Romans. And in Romans chapter 16, verse 26, Paul makes a boast here. He says in verse 26, Now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting of God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Paul says that he has preached the gospel to all nations. Well, obviously he could not have literally done that, but figuratively, yes, he did. Preach the gospel to all, all nations. All right, now turn over to the first chapter of Colossians. And in Ch Colossians chapter 1, he makes two more boastful statements here. Colossians chapter 1, and the first, uh, first of all, in verse 5 and 6. Colossians 1, 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereby ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. All the world. Paul says we have taken the gospel to all the world. He said in Romans, all nations. Here in Colossians chapter 1, he says we've reached all the world. And then in the same first chapter there, verse 23, he says, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to, look at there, every creature. Wow, he really narrows it down. Every creature. Well, obviously this cannot actually be a strict, literal statement, but basically he reached all the world, all the nations, and all creatures with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he did it basically by himself. So this is his report on Asia, that all that dwell in Asia have heard the word of God, but there's another side to the coin. Look at the next verse here, Acts 19.27. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. So Paul says we have taken the gospel into all Asia, but the report there from Asia is that all Asia and all the world is worshiping the goddess Diana. Deanna. And so uh, we, we have a conflict here. Now this is in 56 AD. All Asia heard the word of God. Secondly, all Asia was worshiping Deanna. Now we go ahead to three years. Now we're up to 59 AD. Paul, for some reason, has no time for Asia. He's in a hurry to get to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And to do this, Paul goes out of the will of God. Paul is he, he's headstrong. He goes out of the will of God. Acts chapter 20, verse 16. Now Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus. Ephesus is in Asia. He had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. He would not spend the time in Asia. That's akin to when we pass up opportunities to witness. We don't have time to spend talking to somebody about their soul. Don't have time to spend talking to somebody about the Lord and, and, the, and salvation. He didn't have time to spend in Asia, for he hastened, if it were possible, for him to be at Jerusalem in the day of Pentecost. Now, to go to Jerusalem for Pentecost put him outside of the will of God. In Acts 21, 4, it, we read in that verse, finding disciples, we tarried there seven days 
who said to Paul through the Spirit, these disciples are speaking by the Spirit of God, that he should not go up to Jerusalem. He says, you're out of the will of God, but he wanted to go there to Pentecost. To do it, he had to forego going back to Ephesus. Before we go any further with this, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapter 2 is where Jesus is speaking to the church at Ephesus. And he makes a condemnation, a condemning statement here in verse 5. He says to the church, this is Jesus speaking to the church at Ephesus, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works, or else, or else what? I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. This was the church that had lost their first love, and Jesus gives them a warning. He says, you repent, and change your ways, or I'm going to remove the light from the city of Ephesus. And did you know that you could go over to what was, uh, where Ephesus was today, and in that whole nation of Turkey, there is not one single legitimate gospel preaching church allowed over there today. Jesus gave the final warning to Ephesus in the book of Revelation. He says, you repent or I'm going to take your light. I'm going to remove your light. Ephesus did not repent. And the light was removed. And you cannot find a church. Now, there are some churches in Turkey, but they're all house churches. They're all underground churches. If the government finds any of them, they close them up and arrest the people they find there. So the light has basically been removed. Paul had no time for Ephesus. It says there, he determined to sail by Ephesus. He had to get to Jerusalem on time for the, for the Passover. And so he's warned, don't go to Jerusalem. What if, you know, do you, you ever like thinking about what if? What if he had said, no, stop the ship. We're, we're Ephesus right here. I'm going to go in. I'm going to preach one more time in Ephesus. Maybe the whole history of Asia would have been changed. All right. Then in Acts 21, 11, and 12, when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, this is one of God's prophets, and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost. Here's another message from the Holy Spirit to Paul. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owns this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when they heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. His first warning is in verse 4. His second warning is in verse 11. His third warning is in verse 12. But he went anyways. And so he, he goes up and, um, and he goes to Jerusalem. He, for the Feast of Pentecost. What happened to Paul in Jerusalem? Paul took the men and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple. This is the temple in Jerusalem. To signify the accomplishment of the days of purification because he wanted to eat the Passover supper. That's what, what he went there for. Until that an offering should be offered for every one of them to be purified in the temple so he could eat the Passover Paul had to make an offering, a blood sacrifice of an animal in the temple. This is the apostle that wrote that we are justified by the blood of Christ. This is, our, this is the apostle that said, in whom we have redemption through his blood. This is the apostle who, who talked about being, being saved and justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he goes into the temple of Jerusalem, out of the will of God, contrary to the word of the Holy Spirit, and he offers a blood sacrifice. The, you know, the consequences of sin, you, you, can, you can't even sometimes, you, you can't even understand what the consequences of sin is because they're so long range. Asia today is still 
feeling the consequences of Paul's disobedience in that manner. Now let's go back to our note sheets here. We're, we go up to the year 62 AD. This is three years later after this happens. Paul is now a prisoner, and the Bible says he sailed by the coasts of Asia. That's in Acts 27 2. Entering into a ship at Ardramatium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia. This is the second time he passed Asia. This time he's going the other way, not to Jerusalem. This time he's going west. He's going to Rome. He's going to Rome because he's a prisoner. He's been arrested in Jerusalem where he was not to go. Now he's on his way. He's on his way to Rome as a prisoner. Now we jump ahead four years later, 66 AD. Just before his execution by Nero, that's Paul, Paul was, was executed by Nero. He had his head chopped off. Paul wrote the sad, these sad words. 2 Timothy 1.15. Remember we said second epistles are always about the apostasy? This is 2 Timothy. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. All in Asia are turned away from me. He neglected Asia, and Asia neglected Paul. Now this is, we have the, the, the steps of apostasy. This is step number one right here. Just to turn away, turn away from the truth. Then we have step two, in this again is Second Timothy, uh, chapter four, verse three and four. But the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. The second step of apostasy is not just turning away, it's now it's a doctrinal thing. They will not endure sound doctrine. You know, uh, uh, we brought that uh, lesson last week about Christendom, and a lady that was in the class, she talked to me afterwards, she says she works in a Catholic church, uh, or not, not in a Catholic church, but for a Catholic organization. And she talks to the nun, nuns quite a bit. And um, the nuns were, were t talking about the Bible, and, and uh, she says, well, you know, uh, God hates sin. He sent the flood to destroy the world because of sin. And the nuns looked at her and they said, oh, God would never do anything like that. He's a loving God. The Word of God, both Old Testament and New Testament, repeatedly refers to the flood. It's recorded in the book of Genesis. Jesus believed in the flood. He warned, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Peter believed in the flood. He wrote about the flood numerous times. Oh, God would never do anything like that. They will not endure sound doctrine. That's the second step of apostasy here. Asia is now in, at this point in the second step. And then it goes on and states, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now here's the third step right here. First, you turn from the truth. Secondly, you cannot accept sound doctrine. And thirdly, you can accept fables. You can accept fables. Where are we in America today? We have turned, step one, we have turned from the truth. The Word of God is not allowed in public life anymore. Okay. The name of Christ cannot be used in a public prayer anymore. The Word of God has been thrown out of the schools. That's way back in the 60s that happened. The, the, the second step here is that um, not endure sound doctrine. Churches are not enduring sound doctrine anymore. You go to a liberal church, and if they use the Bible at all, which many of them never, never do, you're going to hear something flowery out of the Gospel of Matthew or something about Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and just loving everybody and love, 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 and all that business. But then the third step says they have turned from the truth unto fables. America has embraced a fable. It's called evolution. We're in that, at, at this point, we're in that third step of apostasy right here. Then there is step four. Notice also, this is Second Timothy. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. The world, the world has so much to offer. Does the world hold an attraction to you? 
I hope not. Very frankly, there's nothing out there in that world that I'm interested in. The world cannot, cannot attract me at all. Maybe a free ticket to a Tiger ball game or something. <laughs> 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 but the world has no attraction at all. All right. So Demas loved this present world. That's step four, loving this present world. It, notice again in 2 Timothy 4, 16. He says, at my first answer, no man stood with me. Here's, here's the next step here now. All men forsook me. First, it was just Demas that forsook him. Now he says, all men have forsaken me. Asia left, uh, left Paul. Now, now, they did not leave the church, not at that point. They have since then. But at that point, they had not left the church. The church was still operating, but it was not enduring sound doctrine and, and so forth. Well, in Revelation 2.5, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove the candlestick out of the place, except thou repent. That's where he, Jesus tells Ephesus, I'm going to take the light out. If, if you don't repent. And that's step five now, the final call to Asian. And this revelation was written about 30 years after Paul wrote. And here's the, the final call to Asia. And Paul went out of the will of God just so he could go to the Passover. Not only did he go out of the will of God, he sinned further by offering a blood sacrifice in the temple for purification the Bible says we're purified 100% by the blood of Jesus Christ. You don't need any purification. But he did that, and he had to bypass Asia and refused to go to Ephesus the second time. He hurried on his way to Jerusalem. Maybe just one more visit would have, would have done it. One more time to witness. What if? What if? What if? You know, the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a blessed time when we receive rewards, but it's also going to be a time that's not so blessed when God's going to say to us, what if? Remember the ones you didn't witness to? Remember the ones you didn't, you didn't bring to the Lord? So Paul wound up in Europe, not where he wanted to be. He wound up in Europe because Rome is in Europe. He wound up there as a prisoner and he was beheaded in Europe because he didn't want to go to Asia. That's ironic. He winds up being executed in Europe because he didn't want to, didn't want to go to, uh, to Asia. Well, you know, uh, the gospel was taken into Europe. And Europe lasted a lot longer than Asia did in the preaching of the gospel. For the last 700 years or so, there has been hardly any gospel preaching in Asia the area of Turkey there, Asia Minor, uh, Islam has taken it over and for the last 700 years Christians have been murdered and destroyed and churches destroyed and so forth. I was in a number of former church buildings that date back hundreds of years. I was in those buildings in Istanbul and uh, they were all taken over by Islam and they're no longer churches, they became mosques where uh, Muhammad is, uh, Allah is is uh, is worshipped there. So um, since then, Europe has degenerated. By the time of World War II, hardly any people in Europe were even attending church at all. But America was the stronghold by this time. America was a nation that was giving out the word of God. Now we see America in that same decline. First, it started in Asia, then it progressed to Europe, and now it's deep into America. For a long time now, I have been aware of the fact that we are living in the last days. I am so thoroughly convinced now that we are not just living in the last days, we are living in the last of the last days, I believe. The last part of the last days. All of Asia fell first. Then Europe fell, and America seems to be almost gone. 
today. Now, Paul's epistles are so important because we listed here, we didn't list all of them, but we listed a number of doctrines that you can only find in Paul's epistles. You won't find them in the Gospels. You won't find them in the book of Acts. You won't find them in the book of Revelation. You won't find them in the Jewish Christian epistles. These were written, these doctrines are key doctrines, and it's what Peter called the present truth, the dispensation of the grace of God. First time that was preached was in Asia. The gospel of the grace of God, first time that was preached was in Asia. The mystery, the church, the body of Christ, first time that was preached was in Asia. The rapture of the church, well, the first time that was preached was in Europe. But then justification by faith, that was preached both in Europe and in Asia. Grace baptism, marriage and divorce in the church, how to, how to handle it, these problems. Correct uh, use of the Lord's table. Qualifications for pastors and deacons. Uh, and deacons. Uh, the two natures of the believer, that we have the old nature and the new nature within it. All of these things come out of out of the church epistles written by Paul. They're, these are key New Testament doctrines. You neglect the epistles and you <coughs> neglect church truth. But notice the last one there, spiritual warfare. Where was the first time that was preached? It's from the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. That's in Asia. Ephesus, the city that Jesus said, you've left your first love and except you repent, I'm going to remove the light from you. That's where spiritual warfare was first preached, and that's where Satan had a great victory in that very city of, um, uh, uh, of Ephesus. Okay, Paul, in Romans 11:13, he says, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. He, went, he, he, he ministered and started these Gentile churches. And each, as we said, each second epistle talks about this apostasy. In 2 Corinthians, he talks about those that preach another Jesus, another spirit, or another gospel. And then in that same chapter, he talks about false apostles, deceitful workers that transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. And then in uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians, Another second epistle talks about that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. In the same chapter it talks about the mystery of iniquity which doth already work. That's, that's the apostasy that was, has settled in on the church. All of that is there for us. And then finally, second Thessalonians. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the tradition which ye have been taught whether by word or, look at the last two words, our epistles. Paul says, stay in the epistles. Learn the epistles. That's where church truth is found there in the epistles. Well, this is our first lesson in, in the Paul and the seven churches. There's a lot of historical stuff. Now, we're going to progress from this, and next week we're going to get, we're, we're going to get into the structure of uh, those were of three key doctrines. You know, um, the Bible says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. If you have a chair and that chair only has two legs, it's not going to stand. But if you have a stool that has three legs, it'll stand. And three of these churches God has established as a foundation. It's like a three-legged stool. And we're going to see the beginning of that and then get into it in the ensuing weeks. We have nine more weeks in this. And we're going to see those three key foundational teachings in the New Testament and what has happened down through the centuries. It's a, it, it's a marvelous study. I really, uh, it, it's thrilled my heart to go through these things. I hope it will yours also. Okay, next week we'll see you, Lord willing, at 10 o'clock. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, now we thank you for your, the time we have together in the Word of God. And may it be a blessing, Lord, to, to each one of us. And Lord, help us to be established in the present truth of Scripture. And Lord, to stand fast against the world, the flesh, and the devil. 
and glorify your name day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming. You are dismissed.